Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are very honored to be here tonight celebrating the launch of Perfect Black, Crystal Wilkerson's new book, Hot Off the Press Tonight. Um, we are here also with Kiese Lehman. We are joined by the Auburn Avenue Research Library on Culture and History. And um, we're just very, very honored to get to be kicking this book off with you, Crystal. Um, we were just discussing in the green room that Crystal visited Karis with her very first book. Um, and so it's been, it's been some time since that first book. Crystal has written several books, including The Birds of Opulence, Water Street, and Blackberries, Blackberries. She is the recipient of the 2021 O. Henry Prize, the 2020 USA Artist Fellowship, and a 2016 Ernest J. Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence. She currently teaches at the University of Kentucky, where she is an associate professor of English in the MFA and Creative Writing Department. And she's a bookseller. She's been a book bookstore owner um, and has has been uh, weaving through all of these similar paths. Um, we also heard that she is one of the first people to ever publish Kiese, so um, in her literary journal. So one of the things that we love at Karis is when all the threads weave together um, and, and it feels like a homecoming. So um, I wanna just let folks know, please in the chat, shout out where you're watching from. Feel free to ask questions. You can ask him in the chat or you can ask him in this ask a question button at the bottom center of the screen. You know, say hi and uh, make yourselves at home. The Auburn Avenue Research Library is going to be dropping um, further resources in the chat. Just know they're going to be there. You can revisit them at the end. You don't have to rush and click all the buttons. They will stay up. Um, <laughs> so you can just stay with us and be present in this moment, in this conversation. Um, it's a, it's going to be a joyous time. So sit back, relax. We were talking about getting some bourbon. Do what you got to <laughs> do, whatever libation you want to have. Um, but but welcome to Karis. We're thrilled to have you both here. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you right now. And I'm so happy that Karis uh, brought us here. You know, that that is the bookstore for me. And we got to get it right. You were the first people and the only people for years to publish my work. I wrote this essay right. on Kanye West and you did that and you published that for me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting us do it. Oh, yeah, please, Amazing. please, please. And I love how you brought the glasses out. I love how you I, br <laughs> I like how you brought you bringing it real. You like I'm going to oh, bring it real low key, uh, beautiful glasses. We were just talking thank backstage you. and uh, perfect Black was the perfect book for me to read for lots of reasons um, that I want to talk to you about right now, but also after we get off of this. Um, but one of the things you said to me backstage, I want to make sure we bring that to the front stage and start the conversation with it, was that as a fiction writer, you feel a bit exposed in this genre. Can we talk about why you feel exposed in this genre and why you chose this genre as opposed to an overt memoir? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first, there's an overt memoir coming. You know, I have a, a contract for a culinary memoir that's mm. about food that'll come out in 2023. All right. But, uh, you know, this book, I've written poetry for a long time, but my poetry was always, you know, in the journal, in the computer. Every so often I would publish a poem um, and so sort of compiling this, right? Cause these poems are, some of them are written years ago. And so I started, a, a friend of mine wanted to, to look at some poems to publish in an anthology. And I said, you know, girl, I don't have time to fool with these poems, but if you want to see them, I'm like, I, I just sent all the poems to her. Yes. Them all in a folder. And she said, well, there's a book here. And I was like, no. There's not a book here. And so I started thinking about it and it was like putting together, um, some of them are new, but it was like putting together puzzle pieces. And then it became more and more frightening to look at them, right? Yeah. Because um, we were talking about this back in the green room too. So there are, some of them have a speaker. A speaker. Um, some of them are very close to the bone where I'm going to go ahead and say the I. <laughs> uh, so it's a memoir in verse. And uh, when I put them together and, and, and created an arc, 
um, you know, there was my life and there were these, these threads that ran through and, uh, that was scary as hell. Right. I, uh, cause what I do with fiction is, um, some of my fiction has some of those same themes or some of those things that I'm haunted by that I right. sort of go back to writing about time and time again, but they're like this, right. They're like under there. And I get, that's part of my, um, play as an artist to say, yeah. okay, like they don't know, but that thing uh, right, you know, right. me there, you know, that's a part of me up under there. But like with this, um, that's why I was saying I'm really nervous because it's like the vulnerability uh, is so on top with these. You know, a friend of mine um, got a copy the other day and she um, hit me up on, uh, what's it called? Marco Polo. Mm. Her tears was running down her face and um, I didn't answer her for about two days. <laughs> I didn't answer her at all. She was like, these hit so close yeah. um, mm -hmm. and they impacted me and uh, she was crying and I didn't know how to respond to her. I was right. like, I can get myself together if I'm going to yes. be yeah. out well, with this book. But I mean, we you know I'm going to be honest with you, you know, it, it, it's one thing to be exposed out there, but it's one thing, it's another thing to be exposed while you're exposing like a brilliant talent do you know what I'm saying? And there's like, there's, I mean, beyond anything else, I think I want to talk about form. I want to talk about place a lot. Um, but I also just want to talk about otherworldly talent. And, 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 I'm, and I'm interested in, in like how the crafting of fiction led you to this sort of form for this book. Um, but I just want to jump in and start, I think, where this book begins with countryness. You know, you start Perfect Black with the line, uh, the map of me can't be all hills and mountains, even though I've been country my whole life. And I was wondering why it was so important for you to situate yourself as country and someone who is more than the hills and mountains that made Crystal Wilkinson. Mm. You know, I decided a long time ago, even I think even before I became a writer to, you know, that's one of those words that I always sort of held up to the light because yeah. I because I love the outdoors. I love the country, but you know how we do. So I remember, and I write about that in there. But um, how when I we'd have family reunions and my cousins would come in and and they'd say something, you know, say something, Crystal, and I'd say, you know, whatever. My accent was much thicker then. I was, so I might say not right, why, and they'd be like, oh my god, <laughs> right, right. She's so country, and so. I sort of carried that with me. Um, and then I decided at some point to turn it over. Yeah. Right. Like, why can't I reclaim that as, as power and yeah. not as, uh, and not as something negative. And so uh, that's why I wanted to, to start with that and sort of reclaim that power because I am country. Yes. And you started there. And then later on, and maybe in the second or third part of the book, we get own country. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, you know, you really sit in this. But I want to if you can talk. I mean, you write about this, but for people who haven't gotten the book yet, can you talk a bit about why it is important for a black girl, a black woman who was once a black girl to claim countryness in a space in a country where people assume that blackness and urbanity are sort of like the same thing? Yeah. I mean, I think just because of that, you know, I think that um, there are other little black country girls out there who are shirking from the light. You know, I meet so many of them uh, when I when the world was open and I was out in the world yeah. where you, know, you say and that's the key phrase. Right. When somebody says, where are you from? That's and it. you can see you can see everything start to to and they, and they start to think, well, what am I close to? Uh, Atlanta. Yeah. Right, it's right. Like, you're not from Atlanta, right? You know, come on, let's back it up, or whatever. You know, you know, I'm from I'm from Mississippi. Yeah. What part? Where? Then, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, so I wanted to try to write something that, you know, I think our spine should be straight around that, right? You should be able to have your back straight about where you come from and who your people are. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And uh. That was that was sort of the the goal, always the goal, I think. And one of the things that I've always been able to 
sort of like voyeuristically explore initially and then you know later just actually sit down in and bring an integrity to it was the way you write about country kentucky right as opposed to country indiana country georgia country mississippi and and this is a big question but i mean are there any distinctions to be made between country because when you talk about own country you don't say own country you know in kentucky you say you just use country but mm -hmm. do you feel like there are particularities with your specific country in your particular parts of Kentucky? Probably. Mm -hmm. But, you know, of course, I know the difference intellectually, you know, as I've moved around in the world. But I don't know the difference um, innately inside of me. Like, I don't I've never lived uh, in. Well, I've lived in not rural Indiana, but I've right. lived in rural Indiana. <laughs> We we but, walked the same uh, steps and uh yeah what was, that was southern Indiana I believe wasn't it yeah 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 I have uh I've experienced that but um it, sure I think there there are always differences from region to region mm -hmm. but much of it is the same too uh it, it's a good feeling to talk to somebody about about their countryness and and them and you see their heads nod like oh yeah yeah whether it's you know I think for for black people and for, uh, you know, part of my countryness has to do with, uh, has an Appalachian layer. So uh, when you talk about um, re religion, you talk about the relationships to the land, um, you know, the part of the country that I'm from was farming country. Like my grandparents weren't coal miners from Appalachia, they were in the foothills. So right. it was uh, tobacco and yeah. uh, corn Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and all of that, even though I've been away from home longer than I was at home, that's 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 what formed me. Yeah. And, and you write so brilliantly about tobacco in the in the book you write about. I mean, you, you read, actually there's an old two farmers that I want to talk about. Um, but one of the other things I feel that connects us country folk or maybe us southern folk, I'm not sure. But I think country folk um, is this reliance in the presence of grandmothers and in mm. this book oh my lord have mercy like your grandmother if i was hoping it's okay for me to say your your grandmother and your grandfather but your grandmother particularly i just think like reaches out from the page every single time and asks me to put my face closer um and asking about my mother you bring the grandmother to life and you write she scrapes black hair from a hog's pink head and so I want you to talk to me about the importance of your grandmother and your development as a seer, a maker, and how grandmothers uh, played a part in not just your particular family, but other country black families in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I mean, the simple word would be love, right? Can yeah. nobody love you like a grandmama can? Mm -hmm. Like there's not, you know, and I, and I since I am a grandmother now, I think about like, why is that? And I think it's because they have some distance from child raising, mm -hmm. right? Their own direct, them being mamas is different than them being grandmothers. Mm -hmm. So they can come with the, the pure love and the pure wisdom without it being filtered through right. being a, a parent and being a, a, a mama. So I think that's part of it. And, you know, my, my particular grandmother, she was, um, just under five foot tall, but she was larger than life in all our lives. I have a, you know, I'm always posting something on social media about my grandmother. And I have a cousin that says, you know, every once in a while, she'll jump out and say, my grandmother. <laughs> I'm like, no, she's my grandmother. Right. Because uh, she was big in, in all of our lives. And I think that, um, you know, I see it as um you know, in some ways it's it's circular, but this idea of, of always sort of reaching back. Um, and I think I get that from my grandmother because my grandmother would um, sit and talk and sort of look out the window about her own mother and her own grandmother. Yeah. Um, and so I think that 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 I do that uh, a lot myself and thinking about her and, and her wisdom and her love and care and um, 
even her mean streak, like she had one. Yeah, we gotta talk about that. We gotta talk about, you know what? I, I, I didn't prepare you for this and you can say no, but could you read The Water Witch on Invasion for us? Is that is that all right to ask? Sure. Okay, and then I wanna talk about The Water Witch series that, that this happens in the piece. But specifically when you said what you said about the other side of your, gr your grandmother, I, just, I wanna hear that piece because of what you do with voice. And also I just wanna talk about the utility and the function of guns in yeah. the, in the now this is the the water witch um is actually someone else talked about this the other day but the water witch is actually my grandfather and not my grandmother okay. yeah so the water witch on invasion it's serious business to come on a man's land but when they get a hair up the wrong place i always have my rifle ready sometimes i turn the light on so i can see who their daddies are Young white boys are like that sometimes, smelling themselves, thinking they can do it cause I'm black, cause I'm old or just cause. Cause I'm a servant of the good Lord is the reason I ain't never shot one yet. I just say, get on now, get on back where you come from, out into the dark toward the place where I hear the leaves rustling. Next, most all I hear is a gravel crunch as they head on down the road. Sometimes they come closer still that's when I poke that old 22 up toward the trees and let it rip three times. It's serious business to step foot on a man's land. But sometimes when I hear their feet traveling away from me like spooked cattle in the dark, I can't help but laugh. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I, I just, well, one, I want, I want to talk about how you develop this series, right? The water, like, and, but, 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 but I also want to get into not just the politics of toting guns, but just, just simply the utility and the fact that if you step foot on our grandparents' land the wrong way, you were going to get shot. Yeah. That's this, was a, this was a rite of passage for these little young white boys. And a lot of times they would do it like around Halloween. You know, my grandfather's name was Sal Silas Enoch, and they called him Nucky. And um, he was a big yeah. figure in the community. He wore... Um, overalls all the time blue jean overalls and um real quiet tall he was about six two six three and big mm -hmm. right and was known in the community you know here's a black man in an almost white all white community that owns his own land um but there's also sort of a mystery and a power because he don't talk much my grandfather wouldn't say nothing hardly and so he was, there was always somebody coming to test him. It was almost, like I said, a rite of passage for these little white boys. They would be like around Halloween. They would, you know, cut trees in the road or they would come and holler or, mm. you know, do something or try to mess with the cows or the pigs or whatever. And, um, you know, it was sort of a test. Like, what's he going to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. was very... Um, meek in his own way really quiet but you know he'd have to show them every year and, you know, he was a good shot so sometimes it was like Pew! and they'd be like oh shit. wow wow and, and 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 how does allegiance work right because i'm thinking about countryness and and the way blackness i think at once cradles countryness and countryness cradles blackness so we don't talk and write about it enough writ large in the nation but like, did, did you feel any affinity to the other country children that you grew up around, white folk? Or, or you know, like, or, or like, was there a different sort of affinity you felt for country black folk and country white folk growing up? Mm, yeah, definitely there was a difference, right? For one thing, almost every country black person I know was a relative, like for real. I didn't know any other black people that weren't related to me, um, maybe one or two until I went to college. And I was like, oh, wow. black people out here that are not oh, wow. related to me. I like that. Um, and yeah, there was, uh, you know, there were a few, uh, there were good people. You know, there are always good people around. And it was a community that um, had been established. You know, my, my family lived in the same place since before, well, since, since slavery, right? Since right at slavery. Um, and, um, and so the the family was known and the various farming families knew each other and they helped each other out because, you know, like um, if it was time to strip tobacco or house tobacco, my grandfather would go to some of the other uh, white farmers 
farms and help them get their tobacco house or suckered or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever season it was. And then they would come to his farm and do the same thing. So they, mm -hmm. they co opt and helped each other in that way. So in the work, um, there was uh, a sense of community between black and white. Mm -hmm. um, so where I saw that different, like I saw the power my grandfather had in owning his own land and working his own land. My grandmother, on the other hand, was a domestic worker and she cleaned houses for the white folks. And so there was more of a divide there because her role, his role at times was equal with these farms. Right. But my grandmother was in that subservient role where they tried, you know, I, I, to this day, I can't, it's hard for me to fathom how um, when we used to like go into town, you know, and I'm not that old, but we go into town and my grandmother would sort of pull me off the sidewalk almost with mm. if a group of white people were coming. Uh, and they would call her by her first name, Christine, wow. which mm. was, you know, in our church, like, mm. didn't anybody call her, you know, she was Miss, Miss Teen or yeah, yeah. Miss, Miss Christine or yeah. Miss Wilkinson. She wasn't Christine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, it was um, it was complicated, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the first time uh, my grandmother uh, worked at a chicken plant, and when she first started working at the plant, she also she was still uh, uh, working in the, as a domestic cleaner in white folks' houses. And the first time I heard a little white boy my age call my grandmama. <laughs> Just call her. I, I say call her out her name by calling her, yeah. her name. Do you yeah. know? What I mean? like, yeah. You know, I, I I I I I can remember that feeling in my chest. Um, I, I wanted to hurt that man, that little boy, so much. But then I also realized if I hurt that boy, I'm hurting my grandmama's money. Mm -hmm. And I just think something. I mean, I think a lot of what you do in this book, I think, speaks to like the interconnectedness and also the economic necessity of a lot, you know, from the black mm -hmm. farmers piece. And also I want to talk about church because you do so much with church in this piece. And then when I think you've done exactly all that can be done, we, we introduce Prince to church. And I want, and, and, and it makes sense in a lot of ways because Prince is and was so holy to us. But I wonder if you can talk about that a bit for people who have not read that piece yet. What role did Prince and the church have in your life? Well, you know, that piece came, I wrote that piece for the Oxford American. And, um, you know, when Prince died, I had this like online and in-person reputation um, for being like his number one fan, right? So when, when <laughs> Prince died, um, well, when he had been hospitalized, I remember um, we had the bookstore and somebody came into the bookstore and held their phone up to Ron and Ron went, you know, he was like, don't, you know, don't. And I, and I was like, what are y'all, you know, what's going on? Because I saw, you know, a few days after he'd been hospitalized that he was riding mm -hmm. his bike. And, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, whew, yeah, okay, he's good. And um, when they, see, I'm going to start crying. They put the phone up to him and they, they showed the phone to one of the baristas. And, um, and the girl, the woman finally just said, did y'all hear that Prince died? And I collapsed. Wow. And started, wow. I was crying my eyes out, and um, it was such a moment, and it still uh, affects me. Even though you know I've come to like deal with some of the wrong that Prince did, but um, so the Oxford American had asked me to write uh, for their music edition, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a piece where I'm gonna make fun of myself, right? I'm gonna make fun of myself as being the number one Prince fan at this age and still just, you know, whenever he comes on, I'm like, Whoa, yes. You know, and I'm going to be, I'm going to write about that. And so of course, as writing does, you know, those of us that are, are artists, as, when you start turning in, you know, there are these things that, that come up and I was surprised by it um, that writing about Prince um, sort of unearth uh, sexual abuse that happened in church. Mm -hmm and how uh, his music and the lyrics were sort of parallel. Uh, that was a secret, keeping him as a secret from my very religious grandparents was sort of a secret that, that paralleled 
the secrets of being touched by one of the church members. Um, and uh, it wasn't all these years later, you know, at 50 years old, I'm writing this piece and it keeps swinging back and I keep like, no, 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 let's make it funny. And it right. keeps back and I finally uh, gave into it. But it was the first time that I realized where that deep love that I sort of make my make fun of myself comes from because uh, that that's what started it like in church. But of course, that wasn't the end of it, you know, and uh, time and time again, even though his music was very um, um, and still is very sexual at times, um, I sort of took so many of those songs as an as an anthem. Yeah. For me. It saved, saved my life, really. I mean, you write that early in the piece, yeah. right? You write that he taught you how to save yourself. Yeah. Which is different than saying he saved me. I, I just, yeah. I think I think the way you wrote that was just, like, says so much. Can you talk about the distinction between Prince saved me and Prince taught me how to save myself? Yeah. Um, you know, part of it, I think, was his his voice. And you're talking about religion. There, There's a, a, a certain spirituality uh, in his voice. When he hits those high notes. Right. Um, Prince and uh, I just did this thing for a large hearted boy where I talk about all these songs and, and so many of, of the songs that I love are those soul piercing songs. Mm. Right? The ones that make you think, well, ain't nobody else. They singing to me like no, they ain't singing to nobody else. Right, right. And that's for me and in, in my particular circumstance that I'm in now, whether it's a woman done wrong anthem or, or whatever. But like when Prince would hit those notes, I was always like, you know, I could feel that. Uh, sort of in my body and it made me think, you know, there was a time when I was being sexually abused um, and then when those rapes occurred when I was in college, um, I didn't think very highly of myself at all and didn't uh, have any, my self-esteem was totally shot. Mm -hmm. um, but I you could always go to his songs to make me uh, feel to be able to find myself and there was strength and power in dancing oh. to his music yeah yeah i feel that i feel that crystal deeply um and then the title it's just you know why has why haven't most of us not used the title use that title what made you pick that title for that piece yeah if you will the picture yeah um I love, I love that verse. I mean, I think we all, those of us who are yeah. fanatics, like we love that verse. Uh -huh. Yeah, but 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 but, to, but what I really want to say is to name a piece that you got to bring it. You know what I mean? Like you got to, you can't name a piece that lyric from Prince and like not bring it. And and what you do is so interesting. It, like to hear you talk about what you do in that piece. And those of you who are out there listening, please, I think you need to pick up the book for a number of reasons. And a, a lot of these pieces are just like, you should just pick up the book just for that piece. And this is one of the pieces because like, I feel like it's going this way and then it comes back. And I don't know how far it's gonna come back, but then it goes back, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and it also, I feel like you're able to at once hold what feels like, you know, almost young or adolescent like joy, but that, that carries forth. And, and I think that joy sort of like undulates too. And it's, uh, really really incredible way I, and i think if we're going to talk about prince though and when i think about prince i often think about the visual along with the sonic i think we got to talk about and i love the i love the picture there i got i want to talk about what made you and ron decide to shape this book the way you did with the art mm. um well we you know he said on the social media the other day that we always wanted to have a child and we were too old when we got together to have a have a child together so this is sort of our child and um you know it's not uh, illustrations not straight up il illustrations it's um the i think that the art that he does is more in conversation with the pieces um like you can look at some of his art and uh, some of it repeats and um, there are um, some pieces that he had done of me um, in here. Um, I hope at some point when I'm on the road or the virtual road, I'll get to like put some of them up on screen and yeah. sort of talk about them. Um, but we just started, it was a, a, just a project for us. And we just started um, once 
I decided that I wanted to have uh, his art. You know, he's kind of, Ron is kind of curmudgeonly. He was kind of like, oh, you don't need my art. Just, <laughs> just do your <laughs> thing. And I started thinking like, well, what about this piece? What would you have that would go with this piece? Or is there something that's in conversation with the piece? And then some of them um, are new pieces that he that he did, um, mm -hmm. like the one that's with, um, Ask him about my mother. That one's mm -hmm. new, yeah. and there are several of them that are, are that are new. Um, and so it was a great a great collaboration. Um, we've talked about writing a, a book together, um, and so again, this is like the closest that we've come, been able to come to that. Yeah, and I often think that like when artists are able to create work that not just you know is is it evokes home but makes other writers feel at home. And I don't mean just comfortable because home for lots of us is not just a comfortable place. It's a place where we are sometimes comfortably provoked. But this this book more than any other book I've read of yours made me feel so uh, provocatively home. And I think that, I know that has a lot of everything to do with the way you crafted the words, but I also just think the way that you bring in the image, the way y'all bring in the image and, and, and the colors I wanted to ask about the colors on the cover of the book, like that sort of, like, what is that? Pea green with mm -hmm. the black. Yeah, like talk, talk to me about that. Cause I know you could have done any cover. Like why? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, part of what we were, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, interesting how you start doing something and then other things sort of, sort of come, begin to fold in. So um, I wanted, we didn't know what piece to even consider for the cover, but I, and I keep looking over here because I'm looking at the book, but the the cover, mm. uh, you know, it's it's this black girl, and uh, I think that nature is is surrounding her, uh, and so we started thinking about green for nature, and then um, I think when he did a mock up of this, I said, oh, that looks like um, I can't remember which one. Hermit Woman. It looked like one of Gail Jones's mm. old books that like, came out in the seventies, and it also looked like um, one of Audre Lorde's books. So it had this sort of like retro womanist vibe to it, which yeah. I like. Definitely um, does. Yeah, and it, so that yeah, it, it feels throwback e, and in ways that make me feel home. Um, because I think my mother had a lot of those throwback books back in the day, you know, like mm -hmm. the Corregidoras and the uh, um, Nikki Giovanni's and um, Cotton Candy on a uh, what is it, Cotton Candy on a hot summer day, something like that. Um, but yeah, so I I I, t I prepared you for this, so I want I want to jump into it because I'm a little scared too, but I, but I prepared you for it. But let me just also say, y'all, I have a ton of questions, but we want to make this as dialogic as possible. So please, if you have questions for Crystal, please put them in the chat, or not the chat, I'm sorry, in the question where it says ask a question, um, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. But one of the things I wanted to do to you, because somebody did this to me in the interview, and I was real mad at first, but then I was like, <laughs> <laughs> not so mad afterwards, and so I hope you don't stay mad at me about this. But, you know, there's so many names, titles, places that come up in this book. And what I want to do is I want to just throw a few names, places, titles out a few that are actually in the text and a few that I thought about reading the text. And I wanna get your initial impression. And maybe we can sit down and linger in some of these depending on the answer, but I just wanna just throw some out and just get you. And I've, I've always wanted to do this with you, but I'm scared. So let me let me just say, I asked you, you said I could, right? I did, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. But All right, but I, mean, I just wanna name some of the things that. <laughs> The things in this in this in this in this book that I really wanted to hear you say a little bit more about, but I also just want to get first impressions. All right, Indian Creek, home, home. All home. right, yeah, home, home. More than the state, more than the counties. That that is home. That's a black, uh, originally a black township, and of course it was populated by native people before that. So that's that's home on. You didn't. You didn't. You did not. Levels. You 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 didn't. You didn't pause. Mm -mm. No, no doubt. All right. Okay. Um, Nikki Finney. Oh, sister. My goodness. Home man. girl. Home girl. We, um, you know, when I think of, uh, uh, of, uh, Sula, 
we say this all the time when we're talking on the phone, like, uh, you know, we girls together, we, we've known each other for, ooh, 30 years. <laughs> you say, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I always base it on how old my children were when I met her. And I think my, my twin girls were about two or three when I met her. And um, yeah, it's like we've seen like deaths of family members, marriages divorces jobs changing yeah. changing states um literary comeuppances <laughs> i'm gonna act like my oh, light didn't just go on hold on <laughs> uh i hope i can turn this thing back off uh, all right yeah so yeah. We, all, we when we on the phone sometimes it's like you know something happens and we're like yeah we we was girls together, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's just tough. It's just, I, it's hard to me sometimes when people who I look up to ask me to write introductions to their books um, because you can fuck it up. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and, if, and, if you, and if you fuck it up on the first few pages, sometimes people don't even get to the goods, you know? Yeah. But my Lord. That introduction, it, it feels once in a lifetime. Do you know what I mean? Like well, the, she, she knows me so well, you know, mm -hmm. like we know each other like that. Like I could not, I don't think I could write an introduction and do her work justice, um, but we can talk about her work, which we have, you know, we used to call each other at three or four o'clock in the morning. Like we were like, okay, we, got, we need to write more. So uh, I'm gonna be up at three, you gonna be up at three? And then we would call you up. Mm. Are you really up? Mm. Yeah, I'm up. And then it's like, okay, girl, bye. And then we would write. And then we would be like, okay, how'd you do? Like later on in the morning, how'd you wow. do? And so we, you know, we've been tight for, for a long time. And I, when she wrote this and um, the introduction, I read it and cried. Yeah. You know, I, I really uh, sobbed because of course she, she got it. You know, she met she met, got to meet my grandmother before she passed. Wow. As a matter of fact, she came to the hospital uh, when she was when my grandmother was sick. But um, yeah, we've known, and it, and there is something about, like you said, knowing someone that close um, and thinking about, well, you know, should I? And I had a a long list of people to the press was considering, you know, to write an introduction, and I just said. It just has to be Nikki. Has like be it me. has to be. I feel that. Oh, uh, I'm so good. I'm so glad that, that y'all decided to do that. And and it, yeah, I, I mean, again, I just want to encourage y'all. You got to get perfect black, and 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 really sit in what Finney is preparing you for. Like that's what I felt. I felt prepared for. I felt I felt prepared. I felt prepared for what you were about to do to us with with this with this with this book. Um. Okay, so those were maybe tough, but sort of happy tough. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I okay. feel warmed up. You feel warmed <laughs> up. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you. I'm, I'm gonna give you another one. Then I want to go into some else. All right, fried cabbage. Mmm. Uh, what with cornbread? One of the most perfect meals. All right. You gotta have the cornbread. You gotta have the cornbread. And and fried cabbage happens to be one of the meals made by the next name I want to name, which is Ron Davis. Mm. Love, like once in a lifetime, never ever thought I would meet the the perfect partner kind of love. Wow! Wow! wow. All right, and, I, and I, now we warmed up. Giggly schoolgirl. Love schoolgirl love, and yeah, that's it. Old woman becoming a giggly schoolgirl. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I love too about I love how y'all's partnership precedes y'all like all oh, often. You know, there's no doubt there's individuality, but the partnership. You know what I mean? Um, goals, as the young people used to say. Uh, all right, JD Vance. Woo. <sighs> I said I, I, well, I cussed earlier when you said that, so um, <laughs> you might not want to say that. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it, but yeah, I, in my own way, evil, 
evil mofo, I think, uh, just um, to use a book as a weapon. Mm. I mean, that's what I think that book mm. was a mm. weapon. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I don't know how weaponized the, the movie is because I refuse to watch it every time it right. popped up. I, I said, I should watch this so that I can teach it. And then I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. Uh, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna watch it. But I think that, go ahead, I'm sorry. I think it's one of the most detrimental books to, to the region. Mm -hmm. of, of Appalachia and, and everybody says well you know it's his memoir so it's fine to write about his own story but but in that book where he makes that turn yeah um to to take a broad brush uh with with the region uh that's that's where it sort of falls off yeah yeah and it's interesting that that you you feel like he bludgeoned the region which you know, often I just think we need to remember, like, the regions are made up of people. Yeah. And families and relationships. Right. And it's interesting that you can get hoisted up for bludgeoning mm -hmm. the country. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I, um, and so the rest of America didn't get to see this, but I was at a Appalachian Studies conference where he was surrounded by um, hmm. right thinking, not right wing, but right thinking, right. Left, left, leftist uh, activist people. And um, he tried to hold his own, but I remember him looking very, uh, he was sort of dismayed, I think, by to have so many sort of radical, radical white folks saying, "Uh, -uh no, no, not like this." Not yeah, like this. We we're not gonna let you do this. Yeah, we're not gonna let you get by with this. Yeah. We're not gonna keep quiet and uh, sort of revere you. This is what we have to say. And this, I mean, you know, right. this might be reductive. I mean, it is reductive. But whenever I talk to folk from um talk deeply with, with black folk from Kentucky, I, I gotta say like, I'm, I'm often like amazed at the way they talk about their white siblings in the, in, in the state. Because it's not this sort of like referential shit that I think a lot of us in Mississippi sometimes do because we think if we don't do that, some bad could happen to us. But there is an acceptance that like, there's, there's a familiarity, there's a commonality and there's something else. And I just heard that in the way you just talked about that as well, right? Because the bludgeoning, I mean, the folks who got bludgeoned, I mean, the region, you, you got bludgeoned, mm -hmm. your, your people got bludgeoned, right? and mass groups of poor white folk got bludgeoned. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And then it just sort of kept going because, you know, it's like, it would have been one thing if the region was reading it and going, all this bullshit here, but it was read widely. Right. Across the country, you know, New York was reading it, and it was felt like that that in a lot of places uh, in the country, it was just like people were like, "Oh yeah, that's that's what's wrong right there," and right. you know, that, that's that's it, um, which it couldn't be further from the truth. Absolutely. Really. Um. All right, UK basketball. Oh Lord. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I think of UK basketball, uh, I think of my grandfather who used to listen to the Cincinnati Reds and was and loved UK basketball and would lay in his um, his car with the radio on listening uh, to the games. Um, and, you know, all my sort of crushes that I had. Uh, UK ball players because we'd have to watch this, right? We'd have to watch it, or he'd be in the car listening to it. Um, but I'm not a fan. I'm not even a sport. I'm not a sports fan. Right. I'm really not a fan of the. I mean, and this is of course where I work. I'm not a fan of of the sport. I'm not a fan of the legacy. Uh, the sort of racist legacy of yeah. of UK sports. Um. 
I am a fan of uh, the students uh, that I've come to know that play um, sports for UK. Um, and, you know, in our house, we have this um, sort of rivalry. You know, Ron is from Louisville. Oh. He's always talking about Cardinals this and Cardinals that. And so sometimes I get on the bandwagon. I'm like, OK, go UK. Yes. And then it's just like we have this Cold War going on in the house with the with the sports. But I love really it. Not a, I'm not a fan. We, we're just rabid here. People are insane. Yeah. Yeah. With the sports, you know. Turning over stuff, burning couches, right, going crazy. You can't even buy. You know that's when Ron moved here. He's like, we can't even buy a pizza without a wildcat on the box, which is true. Everything, insurance, right, car salesman, everything has it on there. But yeah. all right, all right. How about um? Oh, I really want to hear you get off on this one. Dinner. Dinner, as opposed to lunch or supper. Yeah, yeah. Dinner is the meal that you have in the middle of the day. Right. Where I'm from, it is. <laughs> Where I'm from, dinner is the meal you have in the dinner in the middle of the day. Um. Yeah, that word lunch. <laughs> we, never, we never use that word. <laughs> I love it when I when I I mean that's how it is in my family too. Um, with my grandmama, and when I came up on that um, in the book, I, again, I was just like, I, I understand borders, you know, partially understand that borders are just constructed and blah, 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 but I, I wondered about the different lingo in far as Mississippi, where my grandmama grew up and where I grew up in the summers, and in your parts of Kentucky. You know, one, one thing is, I mean, I mean, what's, you, before we got on, you said, what's the word? Uh, not, not, how you said, night, not, 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 not. not. Not, yeah. My granny <laughs> even says that too. It's so strange. It's so strange. Um. All right. This is what I really want to hear you riff on. This. All, most of these are from the book. Country winners. Country winners. Winters. Country winters. winters. Oh, country yeah. winters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You end the book with 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 riffing on that. Yeah. Um. That that poem is really sort of a a love poem. Um. But. Country winners uh, are often, my country winners were often filled with, with isolation, uh, peace, reflection, uh, and uh, sometimes they were devastating, right? Like I remember one of the most devastating winners, which I'm writing about in my new book about um, feeling like I had dipped into another century, like in my household with my grandparents, because mm -hmm. all the roads were covered. We couldn't get out. And so me and my grandfather, my grandfather said, well, this is what we used to do. Are you going to do it with me? And I said, okay. And he had a, a croaker sack and he carried the sack and we walked to the store. We walked out of the holler where we live, walked to the store, got rice, sugar, whatever staples we needed and then walk back with him carrying this yeah. sort of over his uh over his back um so i think about how how rough you know i sort of romanticize the landscape but country winters makes me think about how you're not in control how much if you truly live in the country like you're not in control yeah yeah and, and, you know, I mean, we're writers, so we work in isolation and we write about isolation and loneliness often. But I never felt it as much as I felt it um, in that in that piece. And when you, you know, the, la the, the last words of that piece also like there's there's an aloneness, but there's a there's a there's a different kind of aloneness, I think, in the country winter. Um, and I think that's even different between Mississippi and Kentucky, because your country winters are going to be a lot colder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the hills, like the you know, like like we call mountains, we call shit mountains in Mississippi that ain't even. I mean, it's barely inclined. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But when y'all uh -huh. talk about hills, you talking about real hills. And when you talk about yeah. mountains, you talking about real mountains. Yeah. And, I, and I, I just think that the mount. I wonder what the mountains and the hills do to isolation. Do you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's for me, um, especially if I'm talking about my girlhood into my my teenage years. You know, I I was. Uh, 16, 
I graduated from high school at 16 and then I was 17 when I moved away uh, to college. Um, so, it was, you know, it was, it was a long time, but um, I think the winters were, mo were both isolating and it was solitude. Like there's nothing like mm. being so far away that you don't hear anything. And especially once the snow comes and buffers everything and the, you have the, we had um, wood and coal burning stoves. So the smell of the smoke, the quietness yes. that the winter brings. And so uh, sometimes if you're in isolation for that long, it reaches from uh, a point of like this beautiful solitude to all those other things that I talked about, like a fear of like, oh, we're going to be out of here. We're going to run out of food eventually. Or um, for me as a young person, it was just like, I can't go to no basketball games. I can't right, right. never get out of this. this yeah. I can't get yeah. out of here. I feel that. Um, all right. I have some other, other ones, but I want to make sure we get these questions. Um, all right. So Jody asks, it seems as if the death of your mom opened in you uh, a fountain of storytelling and identity seizing. Is that true? How has your mom's death driven energized you as a person, as a writer? Mm. Um, I mean, I think one of the things I was working on when my mother died, you know, talking about a, a memoir proper, like I was working on, you know, my mother suffered from mental illness. Uh, she was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic um, when I was a child. Um, really before before I was born, she had been diagnosed. And then um, two years after I was born, um, she ended up going back into institution and was institutionalized for about, about 10 years. Um, so I was writing a book about, about mama and uh, her illness and uh, writing a memoir about how her illness affected me as, you know, being sort of the crazy woman's daughter um, during my whole upbringing. And, my mother was really excited about that book. Uh, she'd given me permission. She was really excited. She was like, when are you going to finish that book about me? Like, what am I going to wear when we go on book tour? <laughs> she was like, ready for all of this. Yeah. And then um, I had been working on it and she she passed away um, in 2016, August. Um, we're close to the anniversary of her death in a, in a few days. Uh, and when I went back and I read what I had written, I realized that I was writing from a place of anger. Like mm -hmm. I was reading those pages and I was just like, ooh, I was pissed off the whole time I was writing this. Not so much at her, but like what I felt like her illness took away from me, like took away all these possibilities of us being uh, a certain kind, whatever my sort of picture perfect idea of what our mothering and daughtering should look like. Right. Was sort of stripped by her illness um and so when i go back and look at that and and try i've been trying to finish that book when i go back and look at it uh i realize now that i have to replace all the anger with grief because where there was a well of anger about her illness now there's a well of grief right um right and so the writing isn't coming from the same place. So I have to find a way to reconcile what I've already written with, with how I feel now. Um, so, but I think I still find inspiration from my mother. Like I, she overcame a lot. She was also extremely talented. Like she could play piano by ear. She was a, a visual artist. Um, she drew drew things and uh, she never got to sort of live any of that out uh, in her life. So I, I think what I do in my, as I sit in my privilege as, a, as an artist, as a writer, um, I think about her a lot um, and think I find inspiration in her. I think this is, uh, I think this question is, could be connected um, by Vicki Stanley. Are the kitchen ghost references and stories and recipes also in the upcoming book? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Be, the, the new book is called Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghosts. 
Mm -hmm. um, it'll come out with uh, Penguin in 2023. And so that book is, yeah, it's all about the matriarchal lineage and food. And, and can I just, this is a sort of crab question, but like, what did you think about the way you use recipes in the, in the, in the verse verses, um, in the third part of the, of the book? Like, I, I just, I just was an, a, like enamored with the recipes. Um, but like, can we talk about, did that come, did you, did you know initially, like, okay, this is going to be a book, this is going to be a poem of actual recipes in it. Um, yeah, talk to me about the placement of the recipes. No, I didn't. Uh, I mean, when I started writing it, um, you know, it's like when I talk about the kitchen ghost, you know, sometimes I I um, will cook with my grandmother's dress in the kitchen um, and sort of a way of bringing her with me into the kitchen. Um, I, you know, I bring my mother along other places, but mama couldn't cook very well. Like, <laughs> she could make salmon croquettes and that was about the only thing she could make. But, um, and potato soup. But, um, it was the voice. You know, my grandmother wrote, when I started looking at her recipes, I have this. Um, and this is a recipe box. And inside here are like things like this with my grandmother's writing on them. Mm. And all of her recipes that she wrote out are like she was talking to you. She's like, well, you want to take this and then you want to do this. They weren't like standard recipes. And so they sort of, through her voice, they sort of floated into to the work. And that's how um, that collection, uh, the culinary memoir will be like that with, with some of her recipes. And then they'll be sort of translated into sort of traditional tra tra traditional recipes. But it's almost like when writers use, um, don't use quotation marks because yeah. they want to to have that voice be present and I like that. Yeah. raw and insular. That's how I felt like the recipes were. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's exactly what it did to me at least. Um, all right, I want to save the legacy question for last. Uh, all right, this is from Amy, incredible Amy. Watching you two talking to each other feels sl soulful, uh, uh, slow, and intentional. It feels like love, a specific love. How do you feel when you talk with each other tonight? And is this similar or different to how you feel at other book author discussions? Is region or country in this space with you all and does that feel a way that you would be willing to speak about? Um, well, I'll take this one because I've thought about this um, a lot because I've thought about, you know, and I think, well, I was gonna say something about Heavy, but it was even before reading Heavy, like I've always felt like you were uh, family like we never met, like we only been met face to face one time. And I can't mm -hmm. think of, of anybody else. And like we had this this list of people that to try to do the book launch with. And I was like, I know I just talked to him in November, but can we get <laughs> cause I feel, I feel like that when I'm talking to you is probably one of the few times that people see me full, I, fully as myself because I feel like we are talking like I don't feel like right the Wilkinson writer or Crystal right. Wilkinson professor uh even though I am those things um I just feel like that we are talking like all those missed conversations that we've had over the years like we yeah. Catch yeah. And, and everybody else is just sort of out there yeah um, and you know I always feel like when we text or write a message to. I always feel like we talked on the phone because yeah. You know, we, we, so we were talking about some professional stuff a little while ago, and I swear we 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 were on the phone, right? Mm -mm. See, <laughs> did that, did that, that shit felt like we were. I mean, I can I can hear your voice saying the things we said, and I mean, it felt like we were on the phone, which means to me that you know, and a part of this is because of what your writing does to me. Like I carry your voice in my head. You know, Ellison always talked about little man at Shishaw Station. Like you're one of those people who I'm always writing to, who I know knows the notes better than I do. So you have to write to that person. You got to write to that person who knows the shit better than you. Um, 
And so anyway, I, that's a wonderful question. And, and thank you for be, for even inviting me to do this. But yeah. Um, I worry about you because I'm like, oh, he's doing so much. But I was like, I wonder if he'll say. And then when you say yes to something, I'm like, oh, well, he said yes. And then I worry. And then I'm like, well, everybody said yes. No, but, you don't need to worry, man. <laughs> you never need to worry. It feels like, um, yeah, it just feels like we're talking. It's, I don't feel like it's an interview or if it's 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 anything with any kind of uh, pomp and circumstance, but it's um, it's just us. Yes. Us. Yes. Um, and this question, I, I really want to hear this question because if it was me, I would run away from this question. Um, but you better than me. <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be? Mm. I don't, I mean, I don't think in those terms. Um, you know, I've been at this for a long time. And one of, one of the things, um, and I was crying about it, that I told my students last last semester was, you know, everybody talks about, you know, we sort of celebrate. I told my students before anybody else that my book had went to auction and this was the first time I experienced anything like this. And so I talked with them and I hadn't really told, I told Ron, I hadn't really told anybody else. And I told my students and I said, but you know what? Like you have to write because because you have to mm. like you have to think about what kind of writer you want to be and um if if you're writing to win awards because you know people are like somebody said something about congratulations you're you're getting more whatever accolades and and mm. i'm like well but even if i didn't i would i mean i wouldn't care if my books were with Toby Press, where I started out, that was in England, or if it was with um, University Press, or or whoever, I just know that I have to. It, it's something that I have to do, and I'm not. I feel like do I feel like I des deserve to get paid after doing the best that I can do with any individual book? Like now, I do. Like that's returns oh. that like that same kind of power that I got from listening to Prince's music. Like I feel empowered enough to say well hell yeah i need to be right. paid for right. it right. but at the same time if i didn't i would still do it and yeah. it wouldn't matter to me if it was on a large press or a small press right right and I just um yeah i don't think about i think a legacy is something that that people will decide about when i'm gone like mm. i don't think about that yeah that's far from my mind any kind of right any sort of legacy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder I wonder if legacy and impact are the same. Do you know? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I think we want our work to have an impact. Yeah. I think this question speaks to like career maybe impact in terms of legacy. Mm -hmm. But if, so if I could like break the question in half or splinter it a bit, I, I, I wonder like what work you want perfectly black to do in mm. the world? Um, I mean, I think that this particular book, um, you know, I'm not, I, I, I think I'm not begging for it, but I want to be, I want myself, my upbringing and people whose experiences were the same to be seen yeah. You know, because I think so often, you know, we just talked about um, he who we don't have to name anymore, but um, <laughs> we were talking about Vance. Yeah. But I'm, that, you know, part of what his book does is perpetuates that there are no, um, no black people. No, you know, we're just not seen. So I think that, uh, that that part of what this book does, or I hope that it does, is that people see me. And like, and like I said, I'm not begging for it, but mm. I hope that I've written it in such a way that it's there and it makes makes it perfectly clear. Right. And that's one reason why um, the title kept coming back. You know, what does it mean uh, to be black? There have been so many instances in my life where I haven't been black enough. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that relates to, you know, some of the same things that you write about. A lot of it has to do with body, like right. be, to be black mm -hmm. in a real space. Um, 
to be fat and black, to yeah. be a fat black woman, to mm. have been a fat black girl. Don't nobody see us. Right. Right. Yeah. And 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 do you feel like that lack of visibility is 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 is, is more acute in Kentucky or in your part of Kentucky you grew up in? Mm, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, we see each other. Right. We see each other, um, but I, I think we see each other sometimes, but you know, I didn't like, I mean, I, I had cousins, but um, outside of my cousins, I didn't see anybody who was like me. I love that piece, by the way, in the book, Cousins. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Um, yeah, and and so and so one of one of my last questions, and then I, you know I want to bring Er on, to, uh, hype this book up appropriately, is well, what do you think, if anything, Kentucky has taught the nation, and what do you think Kentucky has left to teach the nation? Hmm. Um. You know, I think that we we have a lot, you know, there's a lot, you know, Kentucky is home, you know, sort of uh, Frank Walker has this wonderful poem that says something about the beautiful, ugly cousin of, of about Kentucky. And I think that, um, I think that's how I feel about it. It's sort of like straddle the good and the bad and, uh, but it's home, you know, and I feel like it's as much my home as mm -hmm. it is anybody else's who stepped foot through here. You know, I've been, my family's been here for, five, six generations now. And so um, I think part of it, part of my answer, I want to say that that it's not permission exactly, but I think that we haven't been able to show the rest of the country what we have to offer. Mm. Always this one-eyed view of the state. Right. You know, it's always this one-eyed view. And I think, you know, I sort of as the first Black woman to be Poet Laureate of the state, mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, I wish there wasn't a pandemic because I would be all over the place. Like, I'm so proud of that. I'd be like, okay, fat, Black, Poet Laureate. <laughs> <laughs> <In Kentucky. laughs> and so I think I'd be... Um, uh, sporting that a little bit more if there wasn't a pandemic going on, but I think that we haven't haven't even begun to to earn our, unearth all of what Kentucky is and what it has to offer because there is this one eyed view right. of the state and of the region, and until yeah. we're able to uh, see other parts of it, yeah, what other Kentuckians have to offer instead of those sort of stereotypes that you see. Um, I, I just hope one day we're the rest of the state, the rest of the world, the rest of the country, I mean, the rest of the world will will see uh, what the true Kentucky is mm -hmm. like outside of that stereotype. I love that. I love that. And I, I think I think I, I think it is happening. Oh, and I know it is large part because of you and your work. Uh, so thank you for making space and time uh, for me tonight, Crystal. And again, thank you for all your work. But uh, you know, this book is one that I want to I want to read with people, and I want to talk about it. <laughs> so if y'all are out there, please read it. And if you read it, you want to talk about it, you got my email. Email me. Um, and I just want to say thank you, thank you for your work, and thank you for loving us deeply, and thank you for loving Kentucky uh, deeply. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for loving me and for loving us. <laughs> That's what we have so so you know <laughs> Uh all right. Is ER coming up on here? Are we hey. Hey. Um, this is beautiful. Thank y'all so much. Um, I want to let folks know that they can click this teal button at the bottom of their screen to buy Perfect Black from Karis. Um, that'll also take you to our general site where you can buy any of Kiese's books. 
um, and Crystal's earlier books as well. So but the book we are really celebrating tonight because it is its book birthday is Perfect Black. So it really helps um, us and it helps Crystal if you buy the book on its book birthday. Uh, don't wait. It's we want to we want to show the sales, show people out there that this book is important, that it matters. Um, so go ahead and do it right now. Buy an extra copy, buy a copy for your local library, give it to a young person. Um, we we really want to make sure um, that we post these numbers this week. So um, thank you to everyone who pre-ordered it. We know a lot of y'all who are on this call tonight already got your book. So thank you for that. Um, and, and thanks for everyone's beautiful questions. So it's, it's wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to have the Auburn Avenue Research Library here with us. Um, and thank you both, uh, Casey, Crystal, thank you for, for hosting the celebration here with us. It's very meaningful to us. And, um, and we're just always grateful for the, the beauty that you bring to every conversation. So um, I hope that, Crystal, this book continues to live many lives. Um, with lots of people. I know it will. And um, that you both stay safe and well. And let's see each other, all of us. Let's all see each other shit sometime. So yes, absolutely. You know, master not. Let's let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Ready. There, there gonna be some serious literary parties when all this is over. I will be scared. I don't know if anybody talk about that. I'm gonna be that motherfucker who stay masked up for life though. You so you gonna know me by the hat. <laughs> me too. Glasses hey. for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, master, master gonna be the new fashion for life. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we'll all oh, be nerds together. <laughs> thank y'all. Thank y'all for this. Hey.